the uh, news was abroad about three years ago in a number of uh, the media that uh, the world's population was now 50% uh, urban and that uh, received considerable coverage, but I was bemused by the fact that in all of the coverage that I saw, not a single story said here in the year 2008, 50% of the world's population is still rural. There tends to be uh, a, a deep tendency to ignore the situation of that other half. Uh, some have spoken of the urban bias in development uh, or even the tendency not to see the half of the population, <coughs> population that lives globally in the countryside. Now China uh, is a kind of microcosm of that. Most of the coverage, nearly all the coverage for years was of the urban sector, uh, manufacturing the cities, the growth of the cities and their prosperity. Uh, now, according to China's official data, uh, China itself is now more than half urban. Well, the data are somewhat questionable. The definition of urban is probably excessively broad. But uh, it's, it's fair to say that 700 million uh, Chinese still live and work largely in the countryside and are dependent to a considerable degree on their relationship to agricultural land for their status, security, uh, and well-being. Uh, and it's that 700 million that uh, we at Landessa have focused on since our first work in China uh, in 1987. And much of what we'll be talking about uh, today will be the results of a 17 province survey that we've recently completed dealing with rural land rights and a number of associated issues. And of course, it's finally beginning to get some media attention. The Wukong uh, riots and everything associated with them has gotten significant, uh, that, that happening has gotten significant uh, coverage. Um, and those even who are considered urban, as we'll see, many or most of them still may lack most of the services and status and legal status, uh, even registration, that is uh, associated with really being urban and getting urban uh, benefits uh, in China. But one thing that has clearly happened is that urbanization <coughs> has been accompanied with uh, considerable loss of farmland, uh, often under very adverse terms and, uh, for the farmers whose land is being uh, taken away. Uh, and these pervasive land expropriations under various names, you know, more, more often than not as eminent domain or takings for non-agricultural purposes have resulted in both uh, concerns over long-term food security uh, for China uh, and very much for rural social stability. Um, overall, it's clear and has long been clear that the rural population lags the urban population in terms of a number of the indicators. And I'll go to that next one, I think. Thanks. Um, the uh, 2011 data suggests that for that 700 million who live in the countryside and are largely dependent on agricultural land for their livelihood, that uh, 
that average income in that year was $1,100 equivalent for the rural population, while it was $3,800 per capita for the urban population, something like a 3.3 to 1 ratio in favor of the urban population. There is a new World Bank <coughs> estimate just out uh, that uh, suggests that in 2010, so it's a very recent figure, more than 170 million people in China still lived under the $2 a day mark, $2 a day mark, and the vast majority of that uh, poor population uh, is, is rural. And many other measures on which the rural population lags, uh, at least as of several years ago, the demographic data suggested that uh, uh, the big cities uh, have life expectancies around 12 years more than the rural population. Rural infant and child mortality rates are far higher, and they're not at the levels that you find in South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, but infant and child mortality rates are still much higher in the countryside in China than in the urban sector. And there's a major lag in education, medical care, social safety nets, uh, and, and so on. And, and much of this has been associated with so-called mass incidents, riots, and upsets of a number of kinds. The estimates are fairly hair-raising that there have been Supposedly, as of 2010, 187,000 mass incidents nationwide uh, in China, nearly two-thirds of which arise from land grievances. That's about 500 a day. Um, so, and the recent analysis by Chinese scholars, which has appeared in the Chinese media, gives a sense of uh, what the aspects or characteristics of these uh, mass incidents uh, are. And you can see in over half of the cases, they involve mobilizing police forces. Uh, another one out of five cases involved other kinds of uh, extreme measures. And more than half the cases Interesting in terms of those who may be advising <coughs> clients who have uh, projects, investment projects that involve building a factory or using land uh, for other purposes. It's very important to do due diligence to make sure that those land rights have been properly acquired and that the local population is not, not outraged. Uh, so 56% of cases protesting farmers blocked construction or destroyed equipment. Uh, three out of 10 cases, they besieged local government buildings. Uh, shocking is that the estimate is that in 9%, in um, at least one farmer chose to commit suicide to protest. And of concern, of concern all, to all of those certainly who want to see the rule of law prevail uh, in China is that only about 10% involved any filing of formal lawsuits in court. Uh, it was clear that in the great majority of cases the farmers didn't think that that was a place they could go uh, for relief. So to, to, to decisively narrow the rural-urban disparities, to achieve broad-based development and the government's proclaimed goal of a harmonious uh, society, uh, it's very clear, has been for years, but perhaps more publicly clear now that China must review 
must resolve the land issue. By the way, there's a major new report out by the World Bank and the Development Research Center of the State Council, the principal think tank for the State Council in China, joint report, we, we provided input on the land aspect of it, uh, on China in 2030, uh, which places major emphasis on the land issue and the importance of the land issue. Uh, I, it, I urge all those who have keen interest in China to uh, get a good and download the copy on, online uh, and uh, it's well worth, uh, well worth reading. Um, now the legal regime on rural land rights uh, involves essentially two levels of, of land rights. Rural land is owned uh, by collectives and it has now been clarified in the 2007 property law that, uh, that uh, collectives are village, uh, uh, village communities uh, consisting of all individual members and not, uh, not some abstract entity called the collective with one or two cadres speaking for everybody. The collective is all of the uh, individual uh, members. And uh, over the years, the legislative background has been clarified to give essentially fewer and fewer legal rights to the, uh, the group, the collective, and more and more legal rights to the individuals, and the individual farm households represent the other, the second level of land rights. Use rights, which the property law has now defined as property rights, in rem rights, uh, with the, a wide range, really, of owner-like incidents associated uh, with them. And for farmland, the term of those rights is now, uh, is now 30 years. Uh, now, our banker friends tell us that uh, a 30-year right let's say a 30-year leasehold paying zero rent, which would be a kind of economic equivalent. In year one, uh, depending on the discount factor that you might use for future flows of income, that a 30-year rate in year one probably is worth somewhere between 75% and 95% of the value of full private ownership of what we would call a fee simple uh, absolute. So it's a very substantial right. Uh, also, these use rights are now under law to be uh, memorialized in documents, indeed in two documents, a contract issued at the local level and a certificate that comes from county level or higher. You see uh, images uh, here of the land contract and then the cover of the land certificate and some of the inner inside material in the land certificate. And we'll say more, Kayan specifically, we'll say more in a few minutes about the quantity and quality of those uh, documents with very important uh, questions. The biggest problem with Chinese farmers' land rights uh, is their insecurity. Um, and basic laws and policies on paper are pretty good in general, although there are two major holes. One is with respect to the legal <clears throat> the rules having to do with eminent domain, as we would call it, or compulsory takings <clears throat> for non-agricultural purposes. The other vacuum in legal provisions is found with respect to farmers' foundation plots and the houses on those foundation plots. What are their 
legal rights to residential land. Another set of, of problems relating to insecurity <clears throat> is that even though in most other areas uh, the legal rules are pretty good on paper, in fact sometimes very good on paper, that lack of implementation is a, a central consideration. Uh, there, and as part of that, there is a, a lack of supporting institutions generally for property rights, ranging from the quantity and quality of documentation that's issued to awareness of legal rights. And if you have, in theory, have legal rights, but you're not aware of them, to what extent can you be said truly to have those legal rights? And dispute resolution, I noted a few minutes ago, the 10% figure for those involved in mass incidents who ended up going to or bailing of the court system. Uh, and that may be a high figure in terms of people who think their land rights have been uh, impaired, who are willing and able and think it makes any difference to go to the courts. Now, the remainder of my remarks and most of Kayani's remarks will deal with the results of a recent mid-2011 nationwide survey uh, which we carried out in cooperation with Renmin University of Beijing uh, and Michigan State University. It's covered 17 provinces, the ones uh, in the greenish color, mostly in the uh, east and central part of the country. The provinces, 17 major agricultural provinces, which together hold about three quarters of all of the rural uh, population. And the, the survey sixth in a series and involved uh, almost 1,800 households. It's so designed that the results should be good within the plus or minus 2.3 percent range uh, at what designers of surveys would call a 95 percent confidence level. That is 19 out of 20 times it should be good within that percentage uh, that percentage range and you have uh, a couple of uh, illustrations of uh, survey enumerators uh, in the field um, one key threat to farmers land rights is land takings in fact three the survey finds that three out of every seven surveyed villages, and we do one interview per village, have experienced compulsory land taking since the late 1990s, that is since 30-year land rights were formalized in law in the 1998 land management law. And you can see the number marching right up there. Uh, it is indeed a very uh, a very big problem. In those land takings, just to mention a couple of the most salient findings, average compensation of the land losing farmer, equivalent of, to about 18,000 US dollars per acre versus something like $740,000 per acre as the mean or $190,000 per acre is the median that's distorted because there are some outliers of very high values. Uh, based on the reported prices for which local authorities sell the land. So a huge gap clearly between what the farmers are getting and what is being paid as something really approaching market value for the land that's being taken. Not surprisingly, the dissatisfied farmers outnumber the satisfied ones more than two to one. 
and indeed more than one out of six, 17% of the affected farmers who've experienced a taking report themselves as extremely dissatisfied. And these land grievances, as we saw a moment ago, are a key cause of the, uh, of, of the mass incidents that have occurred. And finally, a little pie chart which illustrates those uh, proportions that are satisfied or not in the case of takings. And I will <clears throat> pass the baton now to Kellyanne. Thank you, Roy. The, the second uh, major threat to farmers' land rights in China, as we call it, is forced urbanization programs. These are the programs being promoted by local authorities in different locations in China, uh, most notably in Chongqing, Chengdu, and Tianjin, uh, where governments basically move farmers away from the original living conditions to urban or semi-urban settings uh, for two reasons. One is based on the uh, wrong and misguided notion that the higher urbanization rate it is, the more advanced economy it is. So they're forcing farmers leaving the countries that become quote unquote urbanized. The second purpose is for the local authorities. After the farmers are moving away, they can have the control of the farmland and vacated residential land for more profitable development projects. Uh, in reality here, we found one out of six villages are affected by this type of programs. Uh, about 57% of all the cases affected farmers have lost all their farmland, which means 57% of those urbanized um, uh, uh, farmers have lost their major resource to work on as a farmer. And then 14% of the vacated residential land and 44% of the vacated farmland uh, has claimed to be used as agricultural land. Uh, remember, according to the local propaganda of the authorities in China, one of the main purposes of these programs are to preserve farmland. The reason that moving people away so they can consolidate all the fragmented land parcels together for scale farming, uh, to bring agricultural business in and so forth. But in reality, we found only a minority of the vacated land are using as agricultural land. They basically use them, uh, control the land and use it, convert it for more profitable uh, agriculture, uh, non-agricultural, such as commercial and industrial development, contrary, of course, to the claims of those local authorities. If you move farmers away from the countryside and place them into an urban or semi-urban setting, the next logic step is, of course, to provide adequate status and benefits to them. As we show on the survey here, that's not the case. Those, actually the vast majority of the affected and relocated farmers have failed to become full-fledged urban citizens. Only 18% moved inside an established urban setting, which is either a township or a county seat. The vast majority still live in either in the countryside or at the fringes of the uh, urban development. Only 22% are able to change their residential registration from rural to urban. Uh, only 14% covered by social security system in the city. Only 9% covered by urban medical insurance. Only 21% of the children have access to school. So as a whole here, we can, for sure, at this moment, the vast majority of this so-called urbanized of people, even though they show up in the government data as urban population, but in reality, they're not become full-fledged citizens with all the benefits and status. The third major threat to farmers' land rights uh, is involuntary land transactions. Here, land transactions typically refers to land leases. Uh, the Chinese law at present day prohibits of sale of your land rights or mortgage of your land rights. So land leases are the most common form of land transactions. About 17% of all villages and uh, we found uh, land leases to other companies or outside, well-connected outsiders, uh, wealthy individuals. Uh, one of the major problems of this kind of involuntary 
land leases is because they're down uh, due to a pressure applied by local officials and authorities. 25%, one quarter of all these leases are executed because of direct coercion by the government. Basically, we have a, we have a choice in our questionnaire, uh, questionnaire saying whether or not uh, officials claiming this is a direct order from the upper government. You have no choice but to obey. And if you choose that choice, that means direct coercion. That counts about 25%. An additional 42% we found some level of extent of uh, pressure been applied. So in total, we're looking at uh, almost uh, over two thirds of those leases are done with some coercion uh, without the full consent of farmers. As a result, many of the leases naturally are favorable to the interest of the companies and outsiders. Um, we found that the length of the lease terms in more than one-fifth of the uh, leases have exceeded the legal limit. By that I mean, Roy just mentioned, farmers' land use rights currently are only for 30 years, uh, mostly starting in the late 1990s, 98, 99. So we are almost about reaching the halfway point here. So most of the farmers have about 15 years, 16 years of their rights left. But in one-fifth of the cases, we found the length of the lease term have exceeded, exceeded the remainder uh, of the farmer's land rights. For example, we've seen 20 years, 30 years, and sometimes even 50 years. Those are strictly straightforward, illegal. And by the way, the only way in China you can convert agricultural land to other uses, for example, urban or commercial, is through the eminent domain process or land takings. In this case, if it involves land leasing directly from the farmers to the companies, the land use nature cannot be changed legally. It should remain agricultural. But in reality, we found in one quarter of the cases, farmland has been illegally converted to other purposes. The final but a major problem with farmers' land rights is if the law, Roy said that uh, with recent years we've had some reasonably good laws and policies to provide and recognize farmers' land rights. But then you ask, show me the papers. And you can see a larger number of farmers cannot show the papers. They're supposed to receive two pieces of documents here, a land contract or land certificate. Only 37% of those households can show both papers, and then 40% can only show one, and about 23% uh, have neither. If you don't have the papers, then you're easily more susceptible to violations and threats like unfair land takings, forced organization, or involuntary, uh, forced into involuntary land leases. So China still has a long way to go, even though the issuance of the documentation started in the late 1990s, about a dozen years ago. Not only we look at the quantity and how many land doc contracts and certificates are issued, we'll also examine the actual content of those issued contracts and certificates. It's like you are signing a lease and renting an apartment here. You want to look at exactly what's spelled out in the lease. Here, according to our standards, only about a minority of those uh, documentation can be considered legally compliant, meaning they're containing all the necessary elements of a uh, land rights documents. For example, to specify the uh, starting date and ending date of your rights, to have an adequate and reasonable description of all your land parcels, and even better, with a map to show the location and size of each land parcel. Uh, in reality, we found that's not the case. So the quality has a lot of room to uh, improve here. Another issue we uh, Landesa has worked in recent years is to focus on women's land rights. And in many countries, including China, women's land rights has not been a priority for the government. We found that even though Chinese law specifically states that rural women have equal land rights, but they're not showing on the papers. 
Only 17% of the issued contracts and 38% of the certificates recorded women's names on it. That means if, you mar if your daughter gets married out of the village, if you experience a divorce, the women's land rights probably will face greater threats because their names are not shown in the system. This is a farmer holding an uh, interview, holding their land certificate. Some good news, I guess, finally here. Um, one of the best or most reliable indicators of the security of your property rights is whether or not this property holder making any long-term improvements or investments in the land. Once you have the confidence that your rights are secure and long-term, you tend to make those investments. And in this survey, we specifically listed a number of diversification investments, uh, different from the traditional uh, crops. For example, orchards and greenhouses, pig farms, those are, tend to generate higher value crops and agricultural produce. We found about one third of the surveyed households have made one or two kinds of diversification investments. Typically, those households have some security uh, in their land, so they can make those investments. A big problem related to land rents is access to credit in China, in the countryside. We found the vast majority, 93% of those households have used their own personal family savings to make those investments. Only 15% have been able to obtain commercial loans and credits from formal bank institutions or rural credit unions and so forth. Uh, that indicates a significant uh, uh, breakdown in terms of how farmers can be able to access credit. Uh, the major reason, of course, uh, at least at this moment, cited by the farmers, the reason they're not getting the loans and uh, credits is the banks are not considering the loans, they don't have the proper collateral, or a co-signer. In this case, only 15% are able to uh, go through uh, the banking system getting mostly short-term loan and the amount are uh, relatively small. They also asked in each of the investing farmer's uh, case in that how much income actually generated in the year 2010 because our survey was done in the summer of 2011, so we asked last year, that's 2010, how much total income was generated, and then how much input and the cost and the labor was being, uh, being invested into the project. According to our calculation here, on average, each investing farmer gener uh, received about 1,800 US dollars uh, per investing project. And keeping in mind that at the very beginning, Roy mentioned, per capita income in China is only around $1,100 here. So this project alone can generate more than one per capita income for a year for $1,800. We calculate that as a total that the, all the investing farmers combined generated about $58 billion for, uh, for the year of 2010. That's not a small number. That represents about almost 9% of the entire rural income in that year. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we only have scratched the surface because only a small minority of those farmers having the secure rights and making the investments, the vast majority haven't. If we can tap the potentials, it, it could result in an enormous economic benefits to the entire China. So how do we get there? And what are the um, steps of reform that are needed uh, for, for the future policy and regulatory reforms? We have divided uh, our recommendations. And actually, those areas represent uh, actual projects and our work within China, working with the central government, and sometimes at the local level. Uh, depending on the extent of urgency, we divided those recommendations and projects into three categories. This one describes two uh, major problems requiring immediate attention. One is land takings, the eminent domain problem, where uh, we see a lot of publicity because of uh, the, all the mass incidents has, uh, has caused in recent days. Not only to reform the legal system, but also more importantly, I think more critically, to improve the practice on the ground. 
uh, not only to give a, the, the law not only needs to give out a better and a clearer definition of what is public interest, but also to improve the uh, compensation standards, to give more uh, procedural due process rights to the affected farmers, so they can be better informed, so th they don't have to see the bulldozers come and then be notified. Uh, they have a better voice and greater voice to uh, influence decision making at the local authorities uh, uh, level. Uh, two months ago, Premier Wen Jiabao announced that uh, before he steps down, he wants to complete the, the amendment of a major land takings law. This basically puts pressure on all the ministries to finish that major land takings law, and we have currently been providing advice on that piece of legislation. The second area uh, that required uh, immediate attention is to pr the protection of uh, especially the migrant workers' land rights. Uh, even though they spent a substantial amount of time in the city, um, recent data shows about 250 million uh, rural adults are considered uh, migrant workers today. They're spending over half of the time in the city, uh, but their land rights should be protected. Not only their farm land rights, but also residential land rights. If, if a local government intends to carry out urbanization programs or enforce land transfers to different companies, full consent should be sought from the, uh, from the farmers themselves. This describes a, a list of mid-term reforms, but they're vitally important for, uh, to achieve uh, security for Chinese farmers. The first one is to, uh, issue, to achieve universal issuance of land documents to all the Chinese farmhouses, to ensure everybody have good papers in hand to show what the land is, to show all the uh, people's name is, including women's name, uh, not only to achieve universal issues, but also have better quality. This also involves a recent initiative being uh, promoted by the Ministry of Agriculture a, uh, called Land Registration Pilot Projects to actually use a modern technology like GPS and satellite imagery to actually partial, to map out all the tiny and fragmented land parcels in China. It will take decades to accomplish, but they have started the work that will uh, ensure that uh, help to establish a central database to have all the geographic but also the information of the households. The second area is to make farmers' 30 year rights extendable. There is still a lot of uncertainty as to what happens after 30 years expire. The law says it will be extended, but it doesn't say in what manner, whether, whether or not farmers need to pay a fee to the government. So those are big the important details need to be spelled out. We have advocated in China to our senior uh, contacts with the central government is to make the 30 year rights or well, the least, uh, the most convenient way to do that is make the 30 year rights automatically renewable, free of charge. The third area for the reform is to adopt strict limitation on land holdings by companies and big holders. Uh, not only requiring full consent from the farmers, but also clear penalties for uh, illegal land conversion uh, that ensure not only to protect farmers' interest rights, but also um, uh, to ensure China's food security, as China has recently become actually the number one purchaser and buyer of American agricultural and goods and services since 2011. This slide goes beyond land rights. It describes broader and long-term reforms in areas, for example, uh, effective supporting institutions, institutions that actually can protect and enforce rights in China. It is one good thing to spell out and recognize uh, the rights on the paper, but it is even more important to have institutions to enforce the rights when they're facing threats. A effective and accessible court system, legal aid, and also legal education to raise awareness. And then a strong social safety net system where farmers have not only have the land rights to rely on, but also they have additional support in the system when something happens. The reform of the rural finance system. Um, the reason why land takings have been so pervasive in China for so many years, despite uh, the strict uh, mandates from the central government is um, 
the huge profit margin Willie has described. Uh, when government expropriates land from the farmers, they pay only about 1 15th and 1 20th of the actual fair market value. So profits to be made and the financial incentives are huge for the local authorities to keep doing what they're doing. And recent data shows about anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the revenues of local authorities come from the revenues of land sales. So there should be less dependency. They should change the incentive system to uh, reduce the dependency of local authorities on land sales revenue. Final one. The implications are enormous, not only for China, but for the United States and for the world in general. I, I sincerely believe this is one of the fundamental issues that uh, for China's long-term sustainable economic growth, but also social stability. Uh, yesterday, I was making a presentation at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. On the right-hand side, there was a lady sitting on my right-hand side. I was talking to her and, and find out she was an executive at the General Motors Shanghai Company office during the early days, and she helped start the success story of General Motors in China. And for information here, we have recently had some, some discussion on the papers and on academic circles and political discussions on uh, if and to what extent the federal bailout has helped the auto industry recover in Detroit. Uh, but there is one important contributing factor that has helped the auto industry recovery but got no discussion, that is China. The reason why? The biggest market for General Motors is China, not the United States. General Motors sold 2.5 million new cars in China in 2011, more than they sold in the United States. Ford, Chrysler are not doing better either in China. So without all the Chinese consumers doing all the purchasing, I think the auto industry recovery would not be as remarkable as we see today. Not only cars, but Chinese are buying everything. Uh, but keep in mind here, we're only tapping, if you're a business person, if you're a lawyer, we're only tapping the purchasing power and the consumption uh, power of the higher income urban Chinese. For the 700 million rural Chinese who is making $1,100 a year, they are not buying anything from the United States yet. So if we can give secure land rights to those 700 million people, they will become market participants. They will compete in the world market. They will become not only consumers, but also they will demand a stronger and greater voice in the society. This means great implications economically, socially, and politically. And for that, I thank you very much. So I think you should, um, we have ample time for questions, and we've got two very, very informed people. So if you have questions, why don't you just raise your hand and uh, perhaps stand up so we can all hear you. And, uh, and introduce yourself. As well. Introduce yourself if you remember. I'm Bill Russell, and I guess my question starts with a comment, which is that the, I think the most surprising slide that I saw on the presentation was that 25%, I would say only 25% of the seized land is, if I read it correctly or heard it correctly, is converted to non-agricultural uses. And so I, I guess the question is, what happens to the 75% that remains agricultural? Who is, who is buying that land? What are they doing with it? Is it being put to actually more efficient uses than by the individual farmer? Or is it simply a transfer uh, from one inefficient use to another inefficient use uh, to the benefit, really, of, to the benefit of the local government gaining the excess rents? Uh, let me start and then take on chime in. Uh, that was with respect to the uh, so-called outside boss or corporate acquisitions of land which are supposed to be, because it's not a taking, it's supposed to be used for agriculture. In about 25% of the cases, uh, some substantial part of it, sometimes all of it, is being used 
for manufacturing facilities, uh, high-rise apartments, office buildings, and, and so on, uh, which is strictly illegal. Um, it is uh, sort of un underlying that, or there's a con contextual comment, it's important to bear in mind that, in general, small farms, especially in developing country settings like China, small farms are far more productive on the whole per acre or in terms of total factor productivity than big farms. So when the local cadre come around with the would-be boss and say, give us your land on lease for the next 50 years or 30 years, what they're asking is for a counter market action by the farmer, that is for the farmer to give up his or her land for a less efficient, less productive use than the farmer is now making uh, uh, of that land. And I mean, typically these are called sweetheart deals, deals where the local cadre are gaining some significant benefit as a result of, of the transactions, but in terms of, of the society, the society is really losing because the land will now be used less efficiently. If it's used for agriculture, it's pretty hard to compare the illegal use for manufacturing other purposes uh, with the agricultural utilization. It's, it's apples and oranges, but one can say clearly it's illegal uh, and so it undermines the rule of law generally in, in the society. What is happening in many of these cases, and we've, we've followed up and looked over the years at a number of situations where outsiders have managed to get their hands on farmer's land, and time after time we find that the local cadre or officials who participate in this uh, are favoring the big guy in, in numerous ways. For example, giving them entree to the banking system that usually doesn't provide credit to the small farmers so that they can get credit or that they can get uh, even interest-free loans or say they can get loans that they don't pay back. Or we found cases where they get free machinery to farm the big farm. So all, all, it, things are, all things being equal, shouldn't that make those new, yeah. newcomers, and I'm not defending them, I'm just saying, shouldn't that make them more productive and efficient if they have... Well, not more efficient if you're giving them free inputs. Well, but if they're using, if they're using cap, I'm assuming I can do it for free, but if they're getting capital to invest in the land, doesn't that make it more... Well, productive? but it's a very inefficient use of capital to give it on a, what amounts to 100% subsidized Based on you can make anybody nominally more productive by simply stuffing uh, free goodies into their hands or their operations, but in economist terms, uh, it would not be would not be a good use. It, it would have a high opportunity cost. Those resources should be used somewhere else in the society. But basically, I mean, we certainly would not oppose the operation of the market with respect to leasing, and if farmers freely of their own will as a market decision decide this guy can offer me more per acre to use this land for agriculture than I can make by using it for agriculture, so I'll say yes and lease my land. That's, that's fine, that's the market operating in a normal way. But what we're finding is that the, the market is being grossly distorted in most situations of this kind of leasing. I just want to supplement on that is because it's a very important issue. It's not only talking about land rights, but also the future of Chinese agriculture, the food security issue. Uh, and I, my field work has uh, followed up on large scale land acquisition in China for several years. And I've one of actually one of the largest land holding operators in China is Pepsi. Uh, they're operating large amounts of land grow, uh, potatoes for the potato chip business and uh, there are major international companies like Warehouser and other paper companies lease hundreds of thousands of acres of forest land to 
go to trace and so forth. But uh, all in all, I think if the deals are done in a fair manner, I think a lot of farmers are actually happy to lease the land out. And especially given the trend that the rural population is aging, as well as people are moving out of the countryside for better opportunities in the city, there will be some places where uh, relatively large scale farming will become more feasible. And another, not only companies, but there's another entity uh, recently become legal in China is farmers co-ops. In 2008, China adopted a law that legalized farmers association co-ops. They can pull the resources together and they can achieve some extent of scale. Any? Yes. Fine. Please stand up and okay. introduce yourself. And I'm Amy Guo from the National Committee on U.S. China Relations. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for a brilliant presentation. I do have a question for uh, our moderators. How many questions am I allowed? <laughs> <laughs> I have at least one, four. One, I have two or three. <laughs> I think you should do one and then we'll go around the table and you'll do another one. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll start with my first one. Then. I'm very impressed with your uh, the survey you did, like the field work you did. But when I was looking at the pictures, I wonder, like, how did you choose? the people, the farmers you interview with. When you were doing a survey to fill the work, did you encounter any, let's see, not interference, I'm not using that word, but did you have to get approvals? All the farmers had to get approvals from the local authorities. Because in many other kinds of field work, I understand that's the case. Even if it's not explicit approval, like the farmers, they, you know, they are used to that kind of the way they function in a small village. So they would uh, at least implicitly seek approval from local authorities. So you, I just wonder what was the case in no, your survey. That's my first answer, question. Quick answer to that is uh, our work uh, has a lot to do with field research in China. If we want to obtain the first hand information from the field. Uh, it depends what subjects you're researching on and what people you're working with in China. Uh, for example, we have the relationship with many of the central agencies. If we say, if it's a subject requiring intervening of local officials, then typically we'll go through the central channels and obtain approval, clearance, and also arrange proper people for way to talk to in lo different locations. But if it's a subject, subject uh, matter like this survey, which we intend to collect first-hand information directly from the farmers, the pri probably the most important uh, protocol for the interview is have to be done without the presence of local officials. It's directly between the enumerator and the farmer interviewee, so that we can get the honest response from them. Uh, to do that is we have, uh, that's why we use our local partners in China Remy University. We train uh, senior year and sometimes graduate students as our enumerators. Uh, basically, they are going back to their home provinces and home counties. We set up a list of parameters for them to choose what households to, uh, to pick, what kind of uh, village and township they're looking for. But the main, one of the first uh, protocols is uh, discontinue any interviews if there's local officials are getting involved because they're coming from the local region they should be able to get around and so far we haven't found any problem yet and myself do a lot of uh, interviews in the field and uh, because I, I'm a Chinese, a big Chinese and I can go anywhere just if I, if I want to invest in some particular issue I go to a place I just hire a local cab and get it around it's a pretty effective way to find out information. Do you, I'm sorry, just a follow up. So but do you think that in the case if you have been to Wuhan where they were protesting about land picking, land picking is a very sensitive issue. Just because you are Chinese and you speak Chinese, I, I see lots of problems of just getting into a village and talk with the villagers. We, intention, we intentionally avoid places like Wukong uh, uh -huh. for reasons because we work at the central level. We're not providing direct legal representation or help to the people that are suffering. Even though we do have legal aid and education centers in some places in China, but most of the work are focused on central level policy reform advocacy. So that's why, especially for organizations from the United States, this is why we want, want to maintain a, a low political profile in China so to make us our work more effective. And the, the atmosphere typically is a very positive one. It's people being entered and often others will come in and sometimes you start interviewing one person, you may end up with five or 10 or 15. Uh, the, 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 the basic attitude is, I would say, more 
and the most common basic attitude is finally somebody is listening to me. Uh, that they're very happy to have somebody there who's asking them about these key problems and key issues, and they just hope that somebody will then listen to them. Yes, sir. Do you use a tape recorder, or is it uh, like checking boxes, or is it, you know, questions? You know, just technically, how, uh, how do you do it? Depends on personal style. My style is don't carry anything. Uh, I sometimes carry a small camera to take pictures of the land contracts and certificates and so forth. But normally, I don't bring out anything that could uh, scare the farmers. I normally start, I don't smoke, but I carry a pack of cigarettes with me all the time and go to the theater work back, break the ice. And when the farmers getting comfortable, then you bring out your notebooks and stuff. That, that's what you do. Yes, in, in the back. Yeah, uh, I'm Victor Gallo here at CLM. Um, I was just wondering uh, whatever you said seventeen hundred with the with the sample size. Uh, I'm certain that if China is anything like here, there are certain political subdivisions that are more prone to carry out practices that, that may not be in accordance with law than others. Was there any kind of effort to map the sample to see if, if maybe it was a bias? due to the location of the sample. Uh, indeed, I think there are a lot of actually regional differences among not only provinces, um, practices as well, but also uh, even though in the same provinces we found significant difference in terms of practice uh, among different counties. For example, there are there, there are counties, uh, there, there could be two neighboring counties. One is issuing almost uh, all the land required documents uh, to the farmers. The next, next one is not issuing. And for that, we need to find out there are different reasons behind that. There might be that there is a leader in the county that is more favorably disposed to uh, issuing the documents, but you know, in the other county, there might be lack of resources and funding to do that. So there are different reasons, but there are definitely regional uh, differences across the same. Yes. Hi, Ethan Strauss from Carter Ledger. Um, this is a, sort of a follow-up on, on the first gentleman's question. Um, you, you go to the cities in China, and there are tons of markets with all sorts of vegetables and agricultural products. And if you go out to the countryside, you see these farms are, are really quite quite small, less than an acre, I, I imagine. It just seems like a, a very um, difficult way to get such a quantity of food into, into the cities. Um, do you have a sense of, of the, the actual land use in the rural areas, the breakdown between these tiny farms, and you mentioned taking for sort of a, a more uh, agricultural or more industrial approach to agriculture? Sure. Uh, whether or not there is a, uh, a growing trend of scale farming in China or done by agriculture business and companies, because he says there's a lot of fragmented small sizes. Yeah, no, again, really, if, if, and this is based also on comparative experience, uh, from the standpoint of a vulnerable family with very little cushion, uh, having land broken into a number of different parcels may make a lot of sense because it, you get microclimates and micro events, flooding, drought and so on in portions of villages and when when they first broke up the collective farms in 79-84 and introduced the so-called house, household responsibility system of individual farming in practically every village, the farmers very deliberately uh, did the breakup in such a way that an average family would have a total perhaps of two acres, but it wouldn't be in a single large plot. It would be divided into four or five plots of half an acre or thereabouts. Uh, because they, they worried about the possible impact of micro events on some portion of the village land. They didn't want all of their land in any case to be caught up in that micro happening. Uh, so that again, it's, it's the market at work. Uh, I think uh, when governments try to substitute their judgment for what the farmers 
clearly and voluntarily want to do, uh, they tend to get into trouble. For example, uh, one of the things that has made consolidation programs work, and there have been, for example, consolidation programs in places like Taiwan to get people to put their small fractional parcels together, but to do it under circumstances where a super majority of the village or community votes that they want to do this, that they think it's now time, the technology is such, the irrigation facilities are such that it's possible to safely do it and then provide technical and other support for their doing it rather than having some local cadre or official say, I, I've decided you're going to put your parcels together and oh, by the way, although I'm not going to tell you this, I'm going to hold out about 10% of the total land as I reallocate it, uh, which I am then going to use to uh, sell to some developer without your getting anything because you, you'll believe that you had to, under the prevailing policy, give up this land. Right. I think part of the question, though, had to do with whether or not uh, you can comment upon the comparative productivity of the micro plots versus some of the larger farms. Much, much higher. For one of the most dramatic things we saw in our work going back well into the 90s and, and other scholars had seen even further back in the former Soviet Union in Russia, 3% uh, of the arable land as of 1990 uh, was held in the so-called household auxiliary plots, which were the small plots that every member of the collective farm was able to hold, plus the dacha plots and garden plots that most urban households had in the urban periphery. That 3% of Russia's arable land produced 25 to 30 percent of the total value of their agricultural production, a disproportionately large uh, amount of their higher value production. Or in China itself, under the, uh, under the collective farming scheme until it was bro they were broken up uh, in 79 to 84, uh, it was permitted to hold 5 percent of the collective land in separate plots, which were private plots or household plots. In China, that 5 percent of the land on the collectives, which was farmed individually, produced an, uh, an estimated 15 to 20 percent of the total value of agricultural production. What you find in many developing country situations in terms of factors of productivity, they tend to be short on land, short on capital, but very long on labor. And if, if, if agricultural, if agriculture is organized according to their wishes, what you tend to have is very small farms conserving of land, uh, using a lot of labor and substituting that labor which has low opportunity cost for capital, which would have high opportunity costs. And it turns out to be by, by far the most efficient way of conducting most developing country agricultures, including China. So, but let, let the farmers decide. In other words, don't, don't impo impose some external ideal either from the central government or from the local government. It's even worse when it's imposed by local government because then you get rent seeking and holding out land and doing other things to favor the, the not only the big guys, but the big guys who are your, your nephew or your pal. Um, yes, Frank. Frank Kale, <coughs> uh, you mentioned Taiwan a moment ago and I'm uh, as an anthropologist interested in compar comparisons within a culture. Um, I'm curious whether you have any thoughts about differences between agriculture and land tenure in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the mainland. Hong Kong obviously not being known for its agriculture, but having top agriculture, mm -hmm. perhaps analogous to suburban agriculture around Chinese cities. And then Taiwan, of course, having gone through a land reform mm -hmm. in the early 1950s of one nature, mm -hmm. shifting the landowner's interest into 
shares in industry, and then later, I'm not sure how it has evolved, but any thoughts on the comparison within Chinese culture in these three different areas? Well, let, let me offer just a, a couple of comparative <clears throat> observations. We've done field work in Taiwan. We've done field work actually in, in the new territories in Hong Kong's agricultural sector. Also field work in Japan, which had another major post-World War II land reform, and in South Korea, which had yet another major post-World War. In all, in all of those situations, uh, high productivity and diversification uh, in the then, I'm not sure I can say this for Hong Kong, but in the then dominant agricultural sector helped lay the, the groundwork for the economic miracles in each of those situations. In Taiwan, in the decade after the land of the tillers were formed, in which tenant farmers became almost always owners of the land on which they'd been tenants. Uh, grain production during those 10 years went up by 60%, uh, and total value of agricultural production, total farm income, went up by 150%, as they were getting more and more into higher value, more labor-intensive crops, and the kinds of things that involved the sort of diversification and investments that Ke Yang described our survey finding now for perhaps a third of farm families uh, uh, in the mainland. And, and overall, I mean, the, 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 the total value added per acre or casket, if you will, in terms of grain production per acre, China's doing pretty well but Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea even better in terms of that product. And one other historical note of interest, almost forgotten uh, nowadays, is, is the fact that from the late 20s onward, Mao promised the poor tenants and other rural poor who would follow him that he'd make them owners of their land. Land of the tiller was a very important part of, of the Communist Party's platform. And when they came to power in 49, they initially actually carried through on that promise. Interestingly, they had a land of the tillers program, which was not all that different in design, except for the harsh treatment of many landlords. Uh, not all that different in design than Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. All right, excuse me, I, I want to make sure that we get everybody yes, a chance right. to answer so, the question. And so the, just so just final note on that is in the seven years, 49 to 56, before China collectivized, uh, under that system of initial reform and private ownership, their grain production went up by 70% and their farm income went up by 85%. Okay, yes sir. You mentioned about 180,000 of uh, incidents of protest, right? Which means that we could use 180,000 lawyers to help each group, so, or social workers for that matter, to, to help to organize it. What's the prospect of that uh, potentially developing? For legal aid? For legal aid, we also have to go here to, to provide legal services to the poor. Yeah. Not, not at this moment. I mean, legal aid in China is mostly run by the government. Uh, most of the services are provided in the urban sector. Uh, there are not many legal aid lawyers and offices working for farmers or in the countryside. And we have two small legal aid and education centers, one in Guangxi and one in Chongqing, uh, recently started working on those cases, but still we are not the organization have the resources to cover a vast area of the countryside. And the central government, most of the funding for aid is limited again to the urban sector. So legal aid at this moment is not a, a better solution. I mean, uh, as long as the system is set up in this way, there is incentive still for the local authorities to keep what they're doing. Um, I think you had a question back here. Yeah, uh, Lizzie Bolton from Open Society. Um, you mentioned the 2010 mass incidents, and I was wondering the 10% of the people who did file formal lawsuits Whatever happened to those lawsuits? Well, mo mo the, the ones that we followed through, not in this round of survey, but in two of the previous 
backgrounds of survey, they, they tend to they tend not to succeed, only a minority of that minority actually result in any relief. And I think you had a question. Yes, um, I think you mentioned that um, a lot of women taking the compensation value is only a small proportion of the true market value. I wonder what is the valuation process like? And if I'm a farmer and my lands get taken away by really few um, compensations, what can I do? The, under the current legal structure, uh, the law actually caps the maximum amount of compensation you can get. The calculation formula is uh, the maximum uh, compensation you get is 30 times of your average annual yield of your land. So calculating how much crops or rice you can grow, convert to the cash value and then times 30, that's the highest amount you can get that's in the law right now. But in reality, uh, that formula has not worked well for the farmers because the officials could easily adjust the amount of annual yield in your land and then give you some multiplier less than 30. But when farmers are being taken away the primary working resources of land, then you give them no choice but force them into other situations where they do not have any skills for urban and non opportunities. So the current law, the amendment of the law I just mentioned a while ago is including a discussion on to go beyond the 30 times. Um, there is no, at least at this moment, there is no large uh, active land transfer market to determine what is the actual market value because at least there is no land sale at this moment legally uh, prohibited. But uh, the multiplier, multiplier could go higher, but also the average amount of annual yield could be uh, uh, could be increased as well. And then the urban housing regulation, which was adopted in January 2011, makes a start in terms of in the urban sector looking at a rule which would set a, ma a minimum amount of compensation rather than a maximum amount, but still have the problem in, in the urban areas. You can find a market, it's harder to find market data in, in the rural areas, but still another small step is what, June or July of last year, there was a further decision that said, oh, in this urban improvement that we've now adopted, should in principle and to the extent possible be used for rural takings as well. You know, I think you had, a, I promised you a second question, mm -hmm. and then I know that uh, Jan has a question, and I have a question. Okay. Yes. And then I think we'll probably have to wrap it up. Okay, uh, if you could forgive me, that's two part questions. <laughs> <laughs> They are related. Um, well, first of all, towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned that you would advocate this automatic renewal of the 30 year land use, right? And you think that's going to be good. Um, well, I actually have a question as far as you uh, you were talking about, like actually the, trans, uh, the transformation from the collective ownership to individual 10 year farmer ownership started merely like 30 years ago. So when that started, actually, I understand the 30 year land use, right, was a compromise because the local when they first started the reform, there was a phenomenon like the, those who are associated with power were able to get the better quality or better uh, location land. So to have the 30 year system is like they would have a kind of redistribution. So if you get automatic renewal of the land you already have tenure on, how would you address that issue of, we would say, injustice? And another issue that's related to this, I know you know, in order to address this question and other questions, at least in some provinces, they have already started experimenting what in the common law system, such as Anglo-Saxon system, what we would call as a simple, or like giving out land deeds. I don't know whether you can comment on that. I think they have started like initially in the Sichuan province. Uh, I can very quickly respond to a two-part question. <laughs> yes. Uh, the first one relates to the in, quote unquote injustice of the quality and sometimes the amount of the farmland being held by different households. Because originally all the farmland was distributed based on how many people in each household. And then you will have to decide which land is large and then how good the grade of land is. But all because after 30 years all the population changes everything, it becomes quote unquote unequal. Uh, then there was, used to be a practice called land readjustments uh, to ensure the absolute equality among all the houses 
process. This is a very harmful practice because you don't know which land parcel you find next year, even though that prevents you making long-term investments and is a major threat to term your security. The best way, or better way to address that is through the market mechanism. Uh, if you, there is equal and equal uh, uh, land holding, if farmers want to farm more land, you should go through the voluntary, uh, the private market to seek more land to farm. The second question related to land deeds, actually in Chinese it's called land deeds, but it's not the land deeds in the Western legal sense. Uh, it's not full private title or ownership. It's uh, started in Chengdu and Chongqing, but that term in Chinese represents a construction land quota, where you can use uh, that quota to develop agricultural land for urban land. That quota is tightly controlled in China because the central government wants to control the scale of urban growth. I think we'll give, we'll give Jan Barris the last question, and um, uh, after which we will thank our speakers and let some of you escape. And I'm sure that, that actually um, they will stay and be happy to answer any questions. But um, Jan, you've got the closing question and comment. Well, actually, mine's a three-part question. <laughs> Three part, but it's based, um, it's really very much follows, and, and I didn't want to ask because it's more process as opposed to substance, which is quite interesting, but since there was so much interest in process around the table, I actually found your response quite astounding, that you don't get prior authority from some government and you just send enumerators out to the field and have them talk. I mean, with somewhat limited experience I've had in China, that's pretty difficult, especially when two of the three partners are foreigners. You've just got Randon for your Chinese partner. So my question before Heine had asked hers was, it, it's first of all, it's hugely impressive whether you get the permission or not. It's still a very impressive undertaking that you've done. And especially it's not just the first time you've done it. You've not done it. This is your sixth one. So first part of this three-part question is, are, have all of your surveys been basically on the same topic so that you've got comparable data to look at and compare over the course of the six surveys. Two, um, has it been gotten easier or more difficult over the course of these six surveys, or has it been an up and down thing depending on political context and the time that you're doing it and the places where you are? And three, I would presume, you know, what, what are your major challenges in doing a huge undertaking like this? I would presume it would be the ire of local officials who think you're after them or that whatever the farmers are going to tell you is going to result in headaches for them with their higher ups. And is that the case or not? I'll go very quickly here, really, if you want to supplement. Uh, we typically keep most of the question intact, but we do change about every round of survey which is about one quarter of the questions because of the new emerging issues on different areas. For example, land takings have been a major issue in recent surveys. But it used to be in the early days we spent a lot of time questions on land readjustments, the issue I just mentioned, uh, just because of the policy of relevance and urgency. So we do change questions modestly from time to time. But most of the same so you are able to compare. Yeah, we do course. have historical data on many issues. The second question relates to... Uh, Harder or easier? Well, I would say for... Uh, my general observation is getting a little bit tougher. Uh, Roy used to do a lot of field work in the countryside. We actually... Uh, we have a nickname for Roy. Uh, we call Roy the panda. <laughs> the reason why is it attracts attention. He's a foreigner. Um, that presents great difficulties when we want to talk to farmers in private and directly. Uh, right now, we do most of the field work by our Chinese nationals, and also sometimes with the help of our acquaintance in the government. Uh, but here, uh, numerous, most, most of the time, are uh, college students, and we haven't found any problems at all. The third question relates to uh, the obstacles. I think it's, I think most of the time when we work with the central level government, we find not only you're dealing with the land issue, but you're dealing with political issue. Uh, we're very sensitive as how far we want to get into law. For example, whether or not you advocate 
private ownership in China, which is, at least at this moment, we're not saying it aloud, but we're looking at least toward that direction. Uh, at least we can give farmers long-term security, and then we can talk about future things. So there are political limitations as how far we can do. And then within the system, uh, we constantly need to um, grow our relationship with the government. We work with almost all the central agencies, with the central government, the state council, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Land Resources, uh, MPC, and so forth, and we brief them constantly. But when people come and go, and we have developed our, we both our own champions of land rights for the farmer, but again, you do have opposition forces in the government, you need to constantly be aware and make sure that you keep repeating the same message to them, hopefully someday they will realize it's the right thing to do. And interestingly, I mean, there are three major elements of central government going all the way back to our first work in 87, who very much welcomed the idea that people who were independent and trying to find out just what the facts were, were providing them information. Because very often, in the past, the, the, the tendency had been to go down and try to find out what was happening to the farmers by asking local officials, what's happening to farmers? Are you implementing this policy? Well, of course. In fact, one reason why we started the survey was that it, within a couple of months after the ad adoption of 30-year land rights in the 1998 land management law, there were provinces, as reported in, in Chinese press, they were saying, oh, we've now given documents to 90% of the farmers. So we actually we did some preliminary work in one of the provinces that had made that claim and concluded from that that the figure was probably more like 10%, uh, and that it had started several years earlier when it was a policy, not yet a law. And that gave us uh, the conviction that we really needed we, we had worked previously with folks at Renman University and we then proceeded to start the process of doing the surveys together with survey experts at Michigan State University. Well, let me say thank you. This has been actually a wonderful presentation. Um, um, I'm, we're a firm that does a lot of work in the condemnation field and we do a lot of land use work here and elsewhere and I have to tell you that problems you're pointing out we not only have it in other parts of the developing world, Latin America, I've seen many of the very issues you discovered, but even here, even here we have some of the same process and compensation issues um, in New York City. Uh, so it's a fascinating thing, and I think what you're doing is immensely useful, uh, not just for China and the rule of law, but for feeding the world, actually, in terms of the policies you're talking about. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, and I'm sure you'll be delighted to answer any questions that people may have. But best of luck to you, and thank you. I hope you'll come back and talk to both of us again. Thank you.